Okay. Great. Welcome, everybody. See my flow broken already. Uh, I get the pleasure of introducing Zoe Frank today, who is joining us uh, from Fort Collins, um, Colorado, which is about to get, I guess, dumped on by record snowfall, which is just fun to think about. Um, Zoe was uh, born in Colorado, Boulder, Colorado in 1987. Um, uh, she completed four years of classical atelier training at the Gage Academy of Art in Seattle, uh, and then received her MFA in painting from Laguna College of Art and Design. Zoe has received, <laughs> Zoe has received numerous honors and awards, including three Elizabeth Greenshield grants, three, the, um, Avigdor Arica Memorial International Residency Scholarship, the Artist Magazine All Media Competition Grand Prize of 2012, the Hudson River Fellowship in 2012, scholarships from the Albert K. Murray Foundation, the Stacy Foundation, and the Art Renewal Center. Her work has been featured in Fine Art Connoisseur, American Art Collector, the International Artist Magazine, Artist Magazine, Southwest Art, and the Figurative Artist Handbook, among other publications. Zoe has exhibited in galleries across the United States and Europe, including solo exhibitions at Haynes Gallery in Franklin, Tennessee, Gallery Mokum in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and many group exhibitions uh, including some venues like Arcadia Gallery in LA, Stanek Gallery in Philadelphia, Alpha Gallery in Boston, Manifest Gallery in Cincinnati, Bender Gallery in Asheville, North Carolina. And currently she has, uh, she's working on a show, a solo show at Sugar Lift Gallery in Chelsea, New York, which um, is, let's see, the opening reception would be May 6th, so very shortly. Um, we were really interested in Zoe. This uh, lecture is sort of being hosted by the advanced painting, undergraduate advanced painting course, at the University of Arkansas. And we're interested in, particularly interested in Zoe. Um, she's a unique figure in the painting world in that her approach to painting has continually and deliberately expanded beyond the intense classical training she received. So with that, I'm going to admit one more person and then pass it over to Zoe. Um, take it away, Zoe. All right, thank you. Um, let me screen show up, so I lost my lecture here. Let me find my uh, slideshow to screen share. This was so easy when we did this just before. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that closed. All right, well, thank you all for having me. <laughs> um, Let's see, here we go. Uh, nice to be here with you guys this morning. There we are. All right, <laughs> is that working? Okay, let me minimize this as well. I think I'm good to go here now. All right. Um, well, I wanted to start by showing a couple of the recent paintings that I've been making and then kind of go back and show my progression and kind of how I got here um, over the last 12 years or so. Um, so here's a painting that I just completed. It's right behind me here. Um, and it's going to be in that upcoming show that I'm having in New York. Um, so I've been doing these kind of really for me, there's these, there are these really kind of complicated multiple figure compositions where I'm playing with pictorial space and kind of flattening the space with patterns um, and thinking about how I can make these kind of large complicated figure compositions. Um, here's another kind of in that mode where I'm trying to kind of put all this kind of complicated aspects of, of painting that I'm interested in together. Um, and then I want to kind of show how, I, how I've kind of gotten here. Um, but these are the types of paintings that I'm making right now. 
Um, so I did, um, as Neil was saying, an academic training for four years and we were doing, we spent a year just um, drawing and we would work from the model for three hours every morning and then work from casts um, and master copies in the afternoon. So these are from my first year of that academic training, really kind of learning how to paint. Uh, I think about it as learning how to paint a single object under a single light source for four years, like just figuring out how kind of the structure of um, getting accurate drawing, accurate relationships works. Um, and that was, um, I just, I loved doing that training. It was so much fun. I loved kind of going in depth in that way and just getting to really focus in um, and, and kind of learn how to, how to paint. Um, here's a master copy that I did actually at the Louvre afterwards. I spent two months going and, and doing this copy in person, which was just a really wonderful experience to get to do. Um, and this was a painting from my last year in the atelier where I'm kind of um, starting to make my own, uh, my own work a little bit for the first time. Um, but again, it's this kind of centered um, structure to the composition, a single, single figure. This was a self-portrait here. Um, and, and these were soon after that atelier. So I'm again, kind of really thinking about building form, about how light's working, about how color shifts from shadow up to light, really trying to construct that form. Um, but I, I, I wasn't kind of thinking about um, a kind of composition in a broader way yet. Um, and that's kind of what I've been exploring in the past, in the past years uh, since, this, since this training. Um, again, here thinking about warm and cool relationships, how those shadows can get kind of warm and then the half tones get cool. How can I really make that feel kind of sculptural and solidly painted, um, just a white object on the white wall. So I did this training and then I went um, to graduate school and I was thinking that kind of that I'd learned how to paint and that and that while I was in graduate school, I would be figuring out kind of what to paint. Um, and that ended up not being the case. Um, what I got really interested in as I kind of continued through, um, through my studies was thinking about how I paint more deeply, um, that how we paint actually carries meaning in the work, um, that it's not as much about that the subject matter is like, um, kind of just like the, the means through which I can kind of explore how I, how I paint. Um, so I've been painting really kind of mundane scenes and mundane objects um, in order to explore these different ideas about how I can kind of put the paint on the surface, how the space can work, how the colors can work, that those formal aspects of building a painting are, are so much more interesting to me um, as a painter. That's the thing that I've really grabbed onto um, and has kind of carried me through. Um, so these are just four examples of paintings of trees, right? It's just a tree in the middle of the, of the canvas. Um, but I feel like each of these paintings mean something really different because of how it was made. Um, so we have this early Roman fresco where it feels like it's kind of reinforcing the wall on which it's painted. It has this like solidity and monumentality to it because it's kind of um, reinforcing that wall structure there. Um, we have this Asher Durand, um, which is painted, th th that's maybe kind of the training that I was coming out of. It was this kind of romantic, French romantic painting, um, thinking about, um, you know, and, and the paintings we were looking at were more in that style when I was in the atelier. But I feel like this painting is showing this landscape that's like infused with the light of God and this pastoral, you know, beautiful scenery. Um, and that doesn't feel like the world that I live in right now. And I don't feel like, like, even though I think this painting is really beautiful, it doesn't feel like a, a painting language that I can use um, as myself in this moment. Um, it feels um, kind of really far removed from my actual experience of how it is to be in the world right now. Um, but that means something so, like that painting means something so different to me than uh, the, um, and the Modrian below, right? On the lower left, we have this um, the, the version of a tree where it's kind of um, thinking about the whole rectangle, the whole space, dividing it up into these little triangles, um, these little units of space, um, reinforcing the kind of solidity of that surface. Um, thinking about these kind of um, ways that, that these lines can, can divide up that whole, that whole rectangle. Um, and then the David Hockney is done on an iPad, um, those really synthetic colors. Um, so just thinking about that, that the subject itself maybe is less powerful than the way that it's painted, I guess has been um, the thing that I've been kind of thinking through as I've, as I've been moving forward in my paintings uh, lately. And I've done a kind of a, a series of experiments um, 
that, and some of these experiments have kind of carried through all of the work and others have been kind of set aside, the ones that are kind of serving me, I keep going with. Um, and, and time has been one of the aspects that has kind of carried through all of the work. So I got really excited in graduate school about these paintings that show some aspect of the process of the painting being made. So in the Uglo on the left, we have all these little like tick marks where he's finding the measurements of where those things are placed, where the, where the kind of edge meets the background. Um, and you can kind of see him finding and measuring and working up these paintings um, to this just like obsessive degree here. Um, in the Antonio Lopez Garcia on the right, uh, there's like these kind of texture on the back wall coming through where it looks like he's painted something in and then painted over it. I love how um, this head on the, on the right hand side has like two eyebrows. It's as if he's decided like that the, the head needs to be a little larger and he just sort of halfway enlarged it and then just kind of left it there. Like, okay, that's, that, that makes it the right size. So I can just move on. Um, and so those moments of, of seeing how the painting is built, I think as a painter, just get, make it feel so alive. Um, and so kind of those surfaces become rich with that kind of uh, finding, finding experience happening on them. Um, so this was the first painting I did that felt like a real breakthrough um, when I was in school. And I, I started this painting on two smaller canvases. You can kind of see a division uh, here on the surface. And, and then I ended up expanding them and mounting them onto this larger board. Um, but I was working from a tabaret in my studio where I was using those materials every day. So everything was shifting. Every time I came back to paint the painting, things were in a different position. Um, so I had to paint in a different method than how I had been taught. And what I've found is that I'm not able to like just shift how I like, like if I'm liking how some other paintings look, um, if I'm liking that aspect of time that I'm seeing in other paintings, I can't just make that happen on my own surface. I have to like set up a problem for myself that forces me to make that change. Um, so in this case, having things shift every time I came back to paint them forced me to kind of paint one little section and then paint another section and sort of build this composition in a more organic way in comparison to that atelier training where I was taught to do a meticulous, perfect drawing and then transfer that drawing and do an underpainting and then build it up section by section in this really planned and methodical approach. Um, here I'm like, I haven't even predetermined the kind of the, the dimensions of the surface. I started on these two canvases that had another painting underneath and then decided that, oh wow, these could just be mounted onto a larger board and I could kind of expand this world that I'm looking at. Um, so nothing is pre-planned here. And that for me felt like it sort of accessed this really different way of working for me. And that's kind of carried through everything that I've done since. Um, so this is one of those experiments that just really um, uh, kind of transformed how I was thinking about making paintings. And I've, I've tried to find other subject matter um, that I can explore that same idea with. So painting plants has been really fun uh, because again, it forces me to kind of track these changes. If I'm working from observation, this plant looks different every time I come to paint it. Um, and, and so this started with, um, you know, that lemon was like a little tiny, you know, bud of a lemon uh, when I started and then it kind of developed into a full fruit over the several months that I spent working on this painting. I, when I was doing that academic training, um, I hated still life. I thought it was so boring. And I felt like, like the time that I would spend setting them up was just agonizing, like trying to move things around an inch at a time and, and like build this perfect composition um, just felt like uh, kind of torturous. Um, and, and I kind of re-entered into painting still lifes, you know, after that tabaret painting, um, realizing that I didn't need to compose them beforehand. So this was done in a communal kitchen when I was on that um, a residency program. Um, and so I would come in and other people had used the space and it was kind of recomposed for me every day. Um, and, and this aspect of kind of finding the composition as I went through um, just made these things feel so much more alive and engaged all the way through the process. I felt like it, I sort of found this process that felt like it got more of me into the painting. I feel like if I can get as much of like my own uh, kind of energy into that thing, it has more power to it. It's, and, and I don't think that, um, that this way of working, you know, is uh, like, I, I think it's about kind of finding the thing that gets your own, um, Oops, we're getting some extra noise in there. Um, that gets you most alive when you're working, right? For some people, um, someone was just saying the other day that some artists are more like architects 
and others are more like gardeners. Um, you know, so the architects are like planning everything out and executing it and the gardeners are kind of responding and, and adding things in and changing things. And for me, I think I am more of a gardener painter. Um, but there isn't one right answer. I think it's about finding the, the approach that feels more, um, that gets you more excited and alive all the way through it. Um, and that that kind of can show up in the work in some way. Uh, so the, in, this, in this composition, the lemon was there on the tiles and I was excited about that relationship. Um, and then everything else in that painting was kind of shifting around from day to day. Uh, and I was kind of grabbing onto the bits of it. Um, this was a you know, bathroom sink um, in an old apartment that I, uh, that I was living in. And um, I was kind of excited about the, again, things moving around and shifting every day. And also these kind of color relationships playing, playing through the space. So this kind of overall neutral environment um, and then having these kind of little like musical notes of color coming through it where there's these repeating blues and, repeat, and re repeating um, oranges and greens that kind of bounce your eye through the space. So thinking about how I can use those colors and forms to kind of move my eye around this, um, this whole space of that countertop. And a dish drainer with some mugs, um, thinking about that kind of closed mug and the open mug and kind of relationship to each other um, and these patterns of blue. Um, and again, just kind of finding these paintings as I'm going, as I'm observing. Um, and, and for me, they just feel, I feel so much more engaged and the paintings then feel unexpected and alive for me as I'm working on them. And that's just felt kind of important for me as I'm, as I'm going through these. So another uh, series of experiments that I did was around color. Um, and again, in that, I think everything I've done has kind of been in response to that atelier training, kind of making use of those skills, but then also kind of pushing up against it and trying out all the things that I like wasn't allowed to do in that, in that really kind of conservative training. Um, so all, I was using a limited palette and all of my paintings were in this kind of gray neutral world. And I, I'm, I'm realizing that I, I want to be painting the way I'm painting, not by default, not because I was told to do it, um, but to like, so I'm having to kind of try out the things like the opposite of everything that I, that, that feels natural to me in order to then come back and make it my own and feel like that really is part of my work. Um, so with color, I, I think I really do like those, na those kind of subtle color relationships. Um, but I was kind of forcing myself to set up these really chromatic environments to, to just see, to kind of expand my painting language, to try out the thing that I hadn't tried before. And I think as I've come back to making slightly more neutral colors, um, more neutral paintings again, I'm doing it in a much more informed way. Um, and I'm using um, actually a really chromatic palette right now um, to then mix these really kind of subtle neutrals from rather than having a kind of, um, uh, you know, a very um, kind of limited uh, earth palette and, and those neutrals become kind of a, kind of a default or something, or they all become kind of mixed in the same, from the same pigments, they become much, much simpler. Um, so I think you, doing these kind of color experiments has helped make the, make the paintings kind of more complicated as I've, um, as I'm kind of coming back into a slightly more neutral world right now. Um, but here we have a still life with red and with blue and I'm using colored construction paper in the space so that there's nothing that's neutral there. So that I can't make an overall neutral painting um, because there is color. I have to respond to the color that's in that setup. Here was a, this was an old studio space where I had this really nasty fluorescent lighting in the space. Um, and I was trying to kind of capture the feeling of that horrible light. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of in the evening as it's getting dark. Um, and when I first painted this painting in, it was actually like what I was seeing in the environment was kind of a, neutral-ish um, kind of purpley color. Um, and I painted it all in that way. And it, was, it wasn't like getting the feeling of that light. So I tried an experiment with this one where I, I like turned that neutral purple into this fairly chromatic green um, that, that moves from, you know, kind of a, a cool light green up to a, you know, warmer, darker green um, from one corner to the next. Um, which was the kind of color shift that I was seeing in the space, but I kind of put it into this different key, into this green key, and then painted everything else back in relationship to that new, to that new color. And I feel like it got at the kind of feeling of the space um, in a way that the like accurate color that I was seeing didn't. Um, this like feels like that light felt, um, which was um, 
kind of helpful to experiment with um, so that I don't feel just completely tied to my um, observations, like looking at the relationships between the colors rather than the precisely observed color. Um, so in this case, again, these are um, white walls that I'm painting, um, but kind of cranking the color up, right? So like this, um, in this uh, painting on the left, it was cool outside those far windows. And then this interior laundry room was really warm. Um, and then the light on this door was quite cool. Um, so I'm just like kind of exaggerating those. Like what if that cool light was actually blue, right? Um, what if I just really exaggerated what those relationships were? Can I get it to sit in space and still make sense uh, visually as a painting? Um, and this was a fun experiment where I was, um, just kind of keying everything into red, right? So um, I'm still trying to get accurate color and value relationships here where I have the things that are darker are darker, the things that are lighter are lighter, and the things that are warmer um, go into this orange range and the things that are cooler go into this kind of alizarin purpley range. Um, but it's all within this incredibly, incredibly narrow um, uh, kind of zone, right? I've kind of taken away all the extremes and just looked at this little register, kind of pushing everything into that space um, and playing with a kind of still life and figure that kind of reveal themselves a little bit more slowly over time as you try and kind of find those shapes and all that red. And so this is sort of the order that I ended up kind of thinking about these ideas. So then the next idea that I have been kind of working with is kind of composition and thinking about the whole rectangle, the whole space of the painting. So those first paintings that I was doing with the training um, was just this single object under that single light source. Um, and I've started to think more about how can I get this whole space to be activated, this whole rectangle to feel alive. Um, and something that one thing that's happening with these with the bouillard is there's a lot of this kind of pattern and almost like kind of camouflaging the figures into the space this kind of um, setting, I think that our, our attention goes so specifically to the figure, um, like as people we're like, we're so tuned in to looking for figures in those spaces um, that they have to be really, really diminished, um, kind of compressed on the Susan Lickman, um, made very subtle in order to kind of sit into that whole space of the rectangle. Uh, so I've been playing with some different ways that I can kind of camouflage those figures into the space. Um, in this case, I have a figure um, who's kind of put way back into the shadow and I'm trying to use the light coming in through the window and onto the table um, to kind of direct my eye to pull my eye first so that hopefully you kind of come in with the light and then that figure just sort of sits into the space rather than taking all of our attention. Um, in, this, in this case, using um, these, again, these kind of beams of light on the trash bags and, and on these um, on the floor uh, to again, try and kind of keep those figures just as part of that overall space um, rather than completely dominating. How can I kind of simplify those and pull other things uh, forward a little bit more? Uh, and in this case, again, maybe a, a little bit of both light and color to try and camouflage those figures. Um, playing with kind of cranking all the colors up. What if every color was as, as kind of extreme as it could be? Um, if, you know, walls that are kind of a subtle green, greenish uh, neutral color become actually green. Um, and um, kind of covering up the face of one of the figures with the book and using this beam of light to break up the other face into a weird triangle shape again, to try and kind of let those figures just sit in this larger space. How can they become part of a bigger, um, a bigger canvas, a bigger interior space that lets my eye kind of move, move around a little bit more. And I think thinking about the color, so I, I did a series of these where the color is just all keyed up, um, so extreme. Um, and it ended up feeling like there was nowhere else to go with that. Like I'd push the color as far as it could go. Um, and then I was feeling limited, like that, that the colors couldn't get any more chromatic. Um, and, and I think I've had to kind of back off and think a lot more subtly about color since then. Um, that like the, the amount of color relationships that you can create are so infinite, um, but they, are, they have to be within these more neutral, more subtle, more complicated relationships. If everything's keyed up, there's sort of only so far you can go with that. Um, so pushing it to that extreme, I think was helpful um, to then be able to kind of back off from it, I guess. 
another way that it's been helpful to me to think about the kind of overall composition of the space is thinking about different perspectives. So in this one, I'm looking more down on this table rather than kind of presenting these objects, you know, up on a on a mantelpiece or something. Um, it's, it's more kind of how we actually engage with objects on a day-to-day -day basis, like how we would reach down and, and be looking at these things and would be able to kind of pick up that teapot, um, the way that we're actually engaging uh, with the world in an, on an everyday basis. Um, and I think that those kind of looking down perspectives also help me kind of move through that whole space. They help, it helps kind of activate the whole rectangle for me. So the next uh, series of ideas that I was thinking about were, were, was pictorial space, thinking about that kind of, um, rather than just the composition of the rectangle, um, the kind of flat arrangement of shapes on the rectangle, how is, it, how is the painting working in terms of depth and flatness, uh, the kind of depth of the painting um, versus the things sitting on the flat surface. And I had been taught again in that atelier training, um, how to create the illusion of depth, how to create this, you know, this um, linear perspective and atmospheric perspective to, to give this illusion of, of a lot of space as if the painting is kind of you know, a window into another world. But lately I've been really excited about these paintings that don't do that, that are, are more complicated, more kind of confusing in their spatial relationships um, where things aren't quite right, but they feel like how we again actually engage with things. Um, so in this painting on the left, this Roman fresco, you know, the ellipse on this little jug is wrong, right? And I've been taught how to make a proper ellipse. Um, so I would think that this was not as good of a painting, right, when I was doing that training. Um, but there's something that's so inviting, that's so tactile, that's so um, kind of like handmade and present about that, that little vessel on these wonky little steps um, that just feels like it, it like wants, it makes me want to look longer. It makes me want to move around this space. It makes me think that I could kind of reach in and pick up that um, these objects um, in a similar way that, 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 that I think is happening with the Cezanne, where again, there's this kind of confusion, this confusion of space, you know, the edge of this table doesn't continue off uh, to the left, um, that things, this, you know, the space feels wonky. It's as if this um, little bowl of fruit is being kind of tipped towards us to show us all that fruit. Um, and, and it's, it doesn't make sense kind of logically in, in a pictorial space way, but it may, or in terms of like linear perspective, um, but it makes sense pictorially. Like these, this painting to me, this Cezanne feels just perfectly balanced and perfectly organized um, that this shape is needed in relationship to the shapes of this screen or whatever it is behind, um, that the movement of these fr fruit through the space um, just has this beautiful rhythm to it, um, that everything feels like it fits together, it kind of locks into place um, in terms of that kind of composition, uh, even if it doesn't make sense kind of logically uh, in terms of how we actually, you know, might, how things might actually look if you were to take a photograph of them. But it is kind of how we actually engage with the space and it works as a painting. Um, and so I've been just so excited about that idea. So I did a series, hmm of um, paintings of sandwiches. Again, I'm just picking like a really stupid subject um, so that I can play with this idea of pictorial space. Um, and, and for me, I think having the subject be have less like weight to it, I think it allows me to feel a little bit more free to kind of play with these shapes and these, and these ideas um, uh, on a more formal level. Uh, if the painting is like, you know, of, of a really intense subject matter, I feel like that dominates so much. You know, but these are just sandwiches with you know deli wrappers, and it's just um, kind of a a little um, like arena to play with here. Um, so I was thinking about this idea of things kind of tipping forward in this Roman fresco. It's as if again that that ellipse is like showing us the fruit, um, where then the ellipse at the bottom of this vessel, you know, is is much more kind of straight on. Um, so I actually did this painting from two different perspectives. I sat up, I sat on a chair for half of the painting and I stood up for the other half of the painting. And the painting was about trying to reconcile those two views and, and make the space work, uh, make, make, the, make it work as a painting um, from those two different perspectives. Um, in this one, I'm thinking about uh, kind of that um, kind of interlocking of light and dark shapes um, like we might see in The Last Supper. It's almost like a yin yang where there's these dark shapes penetrating the light and these light shapes penetrating the dark. Um, and those are kind of fitting the painting together. In uh, this one thinking about kind of like, um, like a Baroque uh, sense of space 
where it's almost as if things are kind of projecting forward from a shallow ground into the viewer's space. Uh, so we often have things like this lemon peel coming off the edge of the table. So it almost feels like the table is like the front surface of the canvas. And then there's these objects that kind of push forward into our space. Uh, so I was trying to make that idea happen in this painting with this kind of paper coming off the edge of the cutting board and that sandwich kind of projecting forward from this shallow ground. Uh, here's a, the, yeah, this doesn't quite fit in that flow, but um, here's a, a, an awkward dinner party painting that I made. Um, thinking, I, I'm kind of always thinking about these paintings in terms, um, in kind of relationship to the history of painting. I was thinking about this idea of repeating poses that I often see in historical paintings. So thinking about these two male figures echoing each other and then the two female figures echoing each other. This is me again. Um, and these hands repeating. Um, so these ways that I can kind of move my eye through the composition um, with this idea of repetition. Um, it's almost like the refrain in a pop song or something. It's like so satisfying when that thing that you heard before kind of comes back around again. I feel like that's like the visual equivalent of that in painting is these um, kind of like repeating moments um, that we have through the, through the images. Um, let's see here. And in this one I'm using, so I'm kind of putting a lot of these ideas together here. Um, so in this wedding painting, um, I was using an, a historical painting, in this case, the Raft of the Medusa as kind of an armature for the painting, almost like if you were making a sculpture and putting in those, those wires underneath. I'm like using that to, to this, this historical painting to um, find the kind of overall composition of these figures um, and then restaging them in this, um, you know, in this different context of a wedding scene here. Uh, but I, I just was picturing those uh, two fellows up here waving down the ship on the far horizon um, as a bride and groom being lifted up on the chairs in a Jewish wedding. I've been to a lot of Jewish weddings over the last few years. Um, let's see. And thinking about, so in this painting, there's this movement. I, I was interested in this painting, how there's this movement from kind of um, despair and death in the foreground towards hope on the far horizon. So it's a painting that kind of moves back into the depth of the painting um, rather than forward towards the viewer. Um, so I wanted to try out that idea. Um, so having this kind of activity of the dancers around the chairs, uh, kind of dancing the horror around, around them in the back. And then in the front, I was positioning these figures who are more, um, you know, drunk and tired and uh, single and alone uh, in comparison to this dancing group around the bride and groom. Um, but I was thinking about how I could combine this um, structure of the, you know, this kind of um, romantic painting structure, uh, you know, of, of this composition with a different sense of space and light. Um, and, and so I was thinking about this kind of Giotto sort of hut for them to inhabit. Um, and this Piero kind of sort of relationship of the figures, the figures really filling the whole space. Um, and having these kind of rounded, bigger forms um, that kind of fill that whole space up and, and kind of flatten the space. There's this real um, kind of confusion of, of perspective in here where everything's kind of pushing forward onto the surface. Um, so I wanted to try and bring those kind of different ideas from different paintings together um, into this composition. I've been starting to introduce these kind of elements of abstraction, these little bits of just breaking apart um, the surface. And I really love these Brock still lifes where he has just these strange divisions of space. Um, and again, I'm like, I can't figure out quite what's so satisfying to me about these paintings. Like they're not, you know, that's not the most beautifully painted guitar or whatever that, you know, that, that instrument actually is. It's hard to even tell, right? But that shape just works so well in relationship to these other shapes. Um, so again, trying to get away from that like tradition that I was taught of like how to paint everything um, perfectly representationally. How do I get these, like the shapes just feel so much more important to me right now. If I can get these big relationships to really work on the canvas, like that feels so alive and active. Um, so I've been trying out kind of breaking up the, up the surface of the, of the composition sometimes in order to kind of try and get the composition to work. Um, again, so that my eye doesn't just go straight to this washer and dryer unit, uh, which is the subject of the painting, but is able to like look through this whole rectangle. Cause it's not that, you know, this is again, a stupid subject. It's not that I care about washers and dryers. Um, it's, it's like an excuse to get shapes happening on, on the canvas um, and play with ideas like 
um, the, the light in this composition in this setup was really warm on the top and really cool on the bottom. And like, could I exaggerate that? Um, could I get these shapes moving through the space in a way that I found kind of visually alive and satisfying for me? And um, this is another, uh, you know, still life um, where I'm working from observation from these objects as they're moving. Um, and this triangle of light was actually um, fabricated that didn't exist. It was like an, an abstract element that I just added in that again made the made the painting have kind of it gave the painting a structure, I think, that, that, that I was kind of imposing on it myself, rather than just responding to the shapes in that environment. Um, I'm able to kind of fit them into a larger um, kind of angular, uh, uh, you know, geometric structure on that whole surface um, that I feel like, again, like worked for me. It sort of pulls the painting into, into, into form. And here's a series of windows that I made while I was in Berlin for the summer, um, kind of looking across uh, at the at the neighbors, uh, spying on the neighbors, and and getting to like see these moments of them in their houses, um, and and starting to work in series. I think has really freed me up here as well, where I feel like. Um, I'm able to try out all these different versions of what something could be, that there isn't a single way that something, the, like the, the single version of it, the single way that it can be, um, but that the light affects the space in different ways each day. Um, the shadows come at different angles. Um, so some of these are the same windows and some of them are, are, are different ones, but they're, you know, they're kind of shown at these different moments uh, as I'm observing them over, over a series of days. And kind of simplifying them too, I guess, rather than um, getting all the detail that might be there. What's the kind of simple, um, kind of uh, more basic version of what that what that what that view is? So I guess because I've been so interested in these formal aspects of painting, I think it made sense that I have kind of gradually gotten more and more interested in in abstraction. In abstraction, um, it, I was not interested in abstract painting when I was younger and when I started that training. Um, it's kind of grown on me, uh, and I've gotten really excited about just how, like the the spatial relationships in this Joan Mitchell are like. The same, the, the same tools that, that you would use to create space in a representational painting, that these don't feel like um, kind of totally separate worlds, uh, that there's things that are kind of coming forward in space, there's things that are moving back in space, there's these kind of moments of smaller shapes that pull our attention and larger shapes um, that support them, um, and these kind of swings of movement through. Um, so the things that I'm interested in about representational painting are also happening in these paintings, um, which has just, kind of expanded what I'm interested in looking at. I feel like when I started that, um, that training, that academic training, um, I was really like loving kind of Renaissance and Baroque painting, like this really narrow piece of art history. And I have since been looking much further back to these Roman frescoes and Piero, like the kind of pre-Renaissance um, and then um, and forward into modernism and abstraction. Um, and gotten really excited about these other kind of ways of working um, and how I can bring more of that into, into the paintings, how I can kind of incorporate that breadth of art history um, into what I'm, what I'm thinking about. Uh, so I've done this series of swimming pool paintings. I, after the wedding painting, I wanted to get more people together in the space um, and I wanted to paint more of their bodies. So I felt like swimming pools would be a great way to get people uh, you know, in their bathing suits, all these bodies pushed together uh, in space again to just play with these compositions. And again, I'm kind of fracturing the space here in order to get my eye moving through the whole composition. Um, those figures just tend to take my attention in, in such a kind of extreme way. How can I get, how can I figure out ways to, to break them up so that my, my eye is able to move around the whole space? And here's a kind of even more abstract version um, where I'm, I was kind of removing the heads and the arms and just finding these little body shapes um, so that I could really move through that whole space. This is one of the first kind of more fully abstract paintings I've made. Um, but both of these were again, kind of in relationship to a historical painting, in this case, the Titian bathers. Um, and, and I don't know if you can see the kind of uh, arc of these figures is sort of repeated uh, in, these, in these paintings, thinking about those poses. And here's uh, my nieces. Um, 
thinking about these as kind of these geometric shapes in the space and kind of breaking up those spaces so again that they fit into that whole into that whole environment. Um, I was looking at Balthus with this composition of the of the two figures, one on, one kind of you know leaning down and the other leaning up. How could I get those figures to relate to each other in an interesting way? Um, you know, in terms of kind of the geometry. And I did a little copy of this uh, this Balthus uh, gal back on the wall here, kind of relating to those uh, those two other figures in the space. Uh, and here's just Hannah on that same couch. Um, but again, thinking about her as a shape, um, how, how, is it, how can these arms and legs form an interesting kind of geometric relationship? Um, I had been thinking about that, uh, this girl in the white kimono. Um, there's a few of these paintings where she's really just draped down across the, across the couch, um, which felt like it kind of captured this, uh, you know, um, kind of early adolescence, this kind of, you know, just the, uh, draping into that couch in that way was, was fun to try and capture. Um, and seeing if I could leave sections of it unfinished. I really like this um, uh, painting down here, the Dermot Kelly. And my watermelon painting, again, these, these kind of older women here in their bathing suits. This is my mom and some of her friends. Um, you know, wanting to paint older women, I think, um, you know, just finding these bodies really beautiful and wanting to kind of paint them in that way. Um, and also not wanting it to have this kind of pull of, you know, uh, kind of the way that, I don't know, younger, younger women's bodies can be sexualized or seen in this kind of more charged way. I think there's something that feels more kind of uh, calming about this, that, you know, that, that lets me think about the painting again, more in terms of these shapes and divisions, um, thinking about packing these figures together in the space. I like this Caravaggio painting where the doubting Tom and where the doubting Thomas, where they're all kind of packed in with their heads so close together. Um, I was trying to get a little bit of that going in this painting um, with them just holding the watermelon at the pool. And here was an eggplant that I just uh, finished this summer in the backyard. Um, again, painting, I, I keep coming, like this, uh, this element of time has kind of carried through um, since I did that first um, painting of the tabaret where I experimented with that. So that's one that's really carried through. So painting this as it was growing and developing and changing um, and tracking those changes in paint um, just makes these things feel more alive for me. And a little picnic back on the on the lawn there. So I think the thing I've been thinking about kind of most recently here is these kind of juxtapositions of different approaches and how could they actually sit together. Um, so I've been trying out all these different approaches, you know, from abstraction to representation, like these different kind of modes of working. Um, and, and in this case, I have kind of two different modes of working um, on each panel. So there are two panels that are kind of you know, sit right next to each other. Um, but one is really rough and crusty and kind of simplified and the other one has um, some more specificity and form to it. Um, and, and letting those just kind of coexist, uh, seeing what that does. Um, and in this case, kind of taking that to the extreme. So this is 15 panels uh, of the grapevine in my backyard. And I started with just these two panels um, over here on the kind of center right. Um, and I did those from observation in the yard, uh, one in the kind of cloudy day and one on, on a sunny day. Um, and then I was thinking about like, how can I just actually show this entire grapevine and kind of everything that it can be like it in its dead state and it in the sun and in the shade and in spring and in winter um, and, and in summer kind of everything that the grapevine can be. And then also trying out all of these different approaches on each painting. So each panel is sort of like a different idea of what I think painting can be. Um, so it's kind of all in here right now, um, all these different approaches. Um, so at working from observation and from photos and starting um, you know, really tight and starting really loose and starting painting section by section or painting on linen, uh, raw linen versus um, plain panels. So that each one has kind of a different thing that I'm trying out in it. And uh, this one is, I have just recently finished, um, just got this photographed uh, yesterday. Um, and so it's two versions of this kind of pool scene after the pool. Um, and I started uh, one 
entirely kind of abstractly and one really representationally. Um, and then they've kind of come together and become a diptych. Um, so I was thinking about this composition um, from Monet uh, of you know, people kind of picnicking out in the, in the garden um, with this kind of diamond shape. Um, and so I was posing people in this kind of pool scene um, based on those poses. I don't know if you can see like this woman with her hand up and the, the man standing there um, are you know, kind of these figures. And then I put, a, put the woman with the baby here and this, this fellow is the guy with the fish. Um, so I'm kind of using those poses again as this kind of armature to build the painting um, and, and starting one from this abstract language and one from this representational language. Um, and then I ended up kind of putting them together and, and having them kind of meet each other somewhere in the middle. So sort of pulling out more forms and more solidity in the abstract one and dissolving um, elements of that representational one um, so that they have this kind of movement from one to the next. Um, again, playing with how, where, where does this painting language sit? Where, where do I sit in this, in this kind of spectrum of what painting can be? Where am I comfortable? Where's my place in that, on that kind of spectrum? Um, and I'm, I'm just kind of finding my way with that here. Um, and kind of enjoying the repetitions and not repetitions, I guess, in this. So there's some kind of, you know, diagonal movements from one painting into the next, one panel into the next, um, and then parts that really do repeat um, where you can see the woman's arm and then the woman's arm and these two different variations of it. Um, so I'm kind of, yeah, I guess I'm excited about this one because I just finished it. <laughs> um, and then this one uh, just finished at the same time as well. Um, and uh, let's see here. This one is based off of um, the Delacroix, the Massacre at Chios. So again, using these, this kind of historical painting for these positions of the figures. Um, so this fellow on the horse is you know, recast as these older women putting up this birthday banner um, and this woman you know, taking off her shirt here. It's this you know, nude babe. <laughs> and I've got this kind of older woman just taking her shirt off. Um, so re kind of reusing these positions as the, as the launching point for this, for this painting. Um, there's kind of this triangular shape um, we have these kind of two triangles to this composition um, and then this area of kind of this dark inverted triangle um, that I was using to kind of build up this, this compositional idea. Um, and then they sort of take on their own life and character and I kind of respond to the painting as needed, uh, you know, in that kind of gardening sense. I'm like, you know, adding in a shrub here, taking out a person, moving them over uh, and kind of finding my way. Um, so I do these studies first. I kind of, I plan it out as much as I feel like I can. Um, so here's a few different studies as I was planning out the positions of those figures. Um, but then when I got to the larger scale, um, like in, in these, the figures are actually much smaller in relationship to the painting. When I got to the large scale painting, I wanted those figures to feel like full bodies that filled up that whole space. Um, so everybody got much bigger and much more cramped together. And I ended up having to kind of remove a, a few figures for them to fit in uh, all together on that space um, as I kind of found it. So yeah, that's a, that's a kind of a tour of where I, uh, what I've been thinking about um, as I've been kind of working my way through. So I'd be happy to take any, any questions here. Wow. And for students, I, I'm happy to monitor the chat if you prefer to, to type in a question to Zoe, I can deliver it if she doesn't catch it as she's responding to other questions. Oh, or is it, I don't have the chat open. Should I open that up? Up to you. I'll okay. monitor. Okay. Either way. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so I hope that makes sense how I've been kind of um, setting up this like series of problems for myself, um, a series of experiments and um, the way that I've kind of progressed with my development has been to kind of try everything out and then set like a lot of the experiments are set aside and I don't come back to them and then others kind of end up carrying through everything that I do after that. Um, so kind of trying out these different ways of working, these different approaches, um, and then kind of each, each painting then leads to another question. It like kind of, I have a new idea of how I could do this better or something else I wanna try um, after each painting. Um, and that's kind of propelled me forward from one, from one project into the next. I had a kind of 
question, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> so the, from what I understood, um, you know, when you were introducing the Bouillard and then this idea of like, maybe like a latency of the figure, like trying to hide the figure. So it wasn't like the first thing that we got to. And it seemed like you were doing that because it was an interesting painting problem for you, but like, do you also like have a unique love for the figure or is the figure just another object in these paintings for you? That's great. I think um, I do I, I do love the figure um, and I was trained to paint the figure. So we spent all of our time just learning how to paint the figure. Um, and then the background felt like this afterthought, like, oh, well now where do I put them? Um, and it felt really important for me, for them to kind of come about together, like all of a piece for the whole painting to emerge kind of as one unit um, rather, than, rather than having this like foreground and background idea. Um, so in this, in this painting, I'm kind of thinking about this whole space, you know, that this, you know, gazebo thing is like just as important as those figures. Um, you know, each, each kind of area of the painting is, is just as kind of thought through. Um, and I think that's felt really important to make stronger paintings for me. Um, I think that when they feel separate, um, and if the, you know, the figure feels like it's considered differently from the rest of the space, the paintings just aren't as strong. Um, so I think it's, for me, it's been, an, it's both been kind of interesting and I love those bouillards and I love the way, the way that that pattern and space works. I think there's something about them, that, about those that I really resonate with. Um, but it's also just been a, a tool to kind of get me to, I think, make better paintings. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think Jasmine had a question. Jasmine, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, hi, first of all, hi. I absolutely love your work. Um, oh, I, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about on your Instagram, you have pictures of sculptures that you've been making. And I, I was just curious about like how you started making those and how they kind of inform your like painting practice. Yeah, that's great. I was, um, it actually fits with this, whoa, shoot, that didn't work. Um, with this last, with this painting, um, I was making, I, so I'm making a sculpture of this girl who's leaning over and holding the fish. Um, so again, I, so I was thinking about having this abstract version and this representational version and then a sculpted version, like how, like I kind of thinking about that, these series that there isn't just one way that something can be and how does it inform each kind of viewing each version of it to have there be these multiple versions of it. Like what does it look, you know, how does, how can those kind of relate to each other? Um, and, and like, how could the sculpture make the experience of this painting um, richer? You know, how could they kind of inform each other, I guess? Um, so I'm actually, I'm gonna finish the sculpture up and have it with this painting in the show. So I'm hoping it'll be kind of in front of the painting somewhat. Um, again, that there, like there isn't one right way to, to work and to, and to make things. I think for me, that's just been really freeing. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. There's a question in the chat about the sequence of your process, like the chicken and the egg. If the, if it, if oh, the yeah. sort of comes from the, um, some master painting that you're finding and then you build from there, or if there's like a, I wanna paint that and then you find a, a master painting somehow to, to help you. Right, yeah, I see that, Sharon. I, I think I've approached it from both directions, actually. So with that, with the wedding painting, I was actually thinking about that raft of the Medusa and was going, I was kind of chatting with it with my um, now husband. Um, and like, how would I make a painting of that? You know, how would I make a painting that was mine based on that painting? Um, and the like wedding idea kind of just like came in relationship to that painting. Um, and so I started with the painting in that case. In this case, I was thinking about wanting pool paintings um, and I was just looking at all of these um, kind of bathers and leisure paintings. And, um, you know, so, so the other one had the kind of Titian bathers, which I was, I was looking at bather paintings um, like from Cezanne and um, uh, Titian and, you know, all sorts of, you know, everything that I could find. Uh, kind of in relationship to that subject that I wanted to approach. Great, I, guess with, the, I mm -hmm. guess with the other, with this one as well, the raft of the Medusa, Medusa painting, the, the, um, the massacre at Chios painting is like in the same room at the Louvre. Um, so it felt like 
I don't know, like to, if I wanted to do another really complicated, packed multiple figure composition, like I, I, that I kind of had that one in the back of my mind because um, it's like right there in the space. So it seems like a natural progression, I guess. Yeah, go on. Thank you for that. I really like the idea. I, I'm taking art history right now. So mm. I saw actually a lot of the same pictures you just showed us recently. And it, it never occurred to me that that's one way to use studying the older pieces of work, you know, to then adapt them just even in the posturing. So I really enjoy learning that today. Thank you. Cool. That's great. Yeah, it feels it feels really important to me that like everything I'm painting is kind of relating to the history of painting, that paintings have to come out of painting. Um, and some of them are like incredibly, you know, literal and direct, like these kind of mirroring of the postures. Um, and others are more kind of, you know, like that, that dinner party painting where I'm like trying out this idea of repeating gestures, um, you know, or some kind of concept that I've, that I've sort of seen from the paintings that I've been looking at um, that I wanna try out, some little kind of experiment that I wanna try that gets me to wanna make the painting. Could, could you tell us a little bit about your process in working from the figure? Do you have a model posing the entire time or do you sometimes have a source and sometimes not have a source? Yeah, it does. It depends. Um, I, these ones are done. I took re photo references for these ones. Um, so I had friends and family come to this space and, and pose in it um, in kind of small groups. Um, and then, um, uh, let me see. So then, and then some other ones I've done, I, I've done from observation. So I really like, I really like working from observation. I do that, you know, I, I think it's been important to me to have at least some observational paintings going at the same time as these ones that are done from photo reference so that I'm like bringing that observational thinking to the photos. Um, but it's definitely a mix. Um, so I, I've done, so I think the, the problem that I've had is when I'm doing the, ones from observation entirely with, with figures, they end up being these very static, kind of more simple compositions. And I've been wanting to try out these um, really exuberant uh, paintings. So th that's been kind of a, a tool to use. Um, yeah. You're, uh, it's, you're Tim Kennedy. I really like your, your work. That's <laughs> nice, to, nice to see you here. <laughs> Eve, enjoyed, enjoyed yours as well. Oh, that's so sweet. Eve, Eve Mansdorf came out to um, LCAD when I was there and got to see her talk. It was really inspiring. I would think I, uh, I was probably along with her. Oh, nice. Yeah, she was. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I didn't have... give a talk. I didn't give a talk at LCAD, but you were that you were studying then. Yeah. So I um. A nice crew of people that you had out there to study with. Very sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And her like backyard paintings with the like inflatable tools. Right. That's like pools. That's, you know, one of the, I've definitely been thinking about her work as well. Oh, that's funny. That's great. I'll nice. tell her that. I'll tell her oh, that. Nice. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> Jump right in, Jody. What you got? Hi, I just, uh, thank you so much. Like I definitely identify with your experience of wanting to push past, I guess, or just explore areas outside and around your original training. Mm. Um, so my, my question has to do with, you know, I really like the way you spoke about, you know, when you choose a wash, you're, you don't, you're not painting about washers and dryers, right? You're just, um, you're, I think you, you a couple times referred to it as like picking something that's stupid, right? <laughs> just to like give you the freedom to explore pictorial space. Now, my question is, how do you, uh, for like the Delacroix painting, you know, the subject matter of that painting is about like tens of thousands of people that were massacred. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> how do you as the artist, like, are you just like, how do you navigate that, like your, your agency as a painter of looking at another painter? But doesn't that bring along with everything that that other painting is talking about? And uh, how do you navigate that whenever presenting it as a pool party? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think for some of them, I have, it, it's a weird thing to be taking a massacre and making it into a pool party. I, I, uh, I agree. Um, I think in this case, I was not really, I was just looking at it in terms of structure and not thinking about it in terms of 
um, content. I was really, and I think like the thing that I love about like the thing that made me want to be a painter was these really complicated multiple figure compositions. And it's, you know, so many of them are about like Jesus and Mary, and I don't care about any of that, but I like love the relationships between the like arms and like the way that skin is painted and how it relates to the space. So I think that I have this tendency to look at paintings kind of separate from their actual content. Um, and so I think that is what I did here. Um, I do think that really great paintings are are like marrying form and content together that the like form and content become inextricable that like how the painting is built is conveying the meaning of the thing. Um, and so I, I think that looking at content is important too and I was I was not quite doing that with this one with, with some of the others, like I have I was looking I wanted to make pool paintings and so I was looking at other bather scenes and things that did re directly relate. Or with that wedding painting, again, it's this terrible story. The Raft of the Medusa is this horrible, you know, story of death um, and cannibalism. Uh, but I am thinking about the kind of relationship of the fate, like the movement in the space from this like hopeful, from like despair to hope in the background and kind of trying to mirror that energy, that kind of movement of, of um, kind of, uh, yeah, the, the like affect of the figures as they're, as they're kind of moving through the painting space. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I'm just looking at them like as if it's a, a Joan Mitchell painting and it's just color and shape and space. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Oh, or Katie. Oh, mine kind of goes along with Kristen's with the pattern and all. Um, I'm just noticing that that is very consistent throughout a lot of your paintings and even in some of the really early observational ones like all the different tiles and like how it seems like those are always present in a lot of them. And I'm, I'm almost curious, like, did you decide like to put those in and they weren't actually there? Because I couldn't imagine living in like this beautiful little tiled house. Like, do, is that actually what it was or where do you pull the inspiration for the pattern? Right. Yeah. I think those, the tile, maybe think about the lemon tree one that has tiles in the background and those tiles were like two blocks away from my studio. So I'd gone for a walk and I saw the tiles and I took pictures of the tiles. Um, and then I like superimposed them onto the lemon tree that was sitting in my studio in front of me for three months. Um, so I'm like pulling these patterns in from other places. Um, but I think, I, I, I guess I really like pattern. Um, and I, I, um, I've been thinking about them almost like quilts or something. I just started learning how to quilt uh, this fall. It's like my pandemic winter activity is that I've made it my first quilt. Um, but I think it's like these kind of flattened shapes and these patterns that fit together in a way that kind of, um, it's almost like collage and kind of moves my eye through this, again, more flat space, this kind of confusion of space that I'm finding really interesting right now um, of these kind of rounded spatial figures with that then kind of go back and forth that kind of compress um, where the wall kind of pushes forward almost. Um, so I think I've been using the patterns as a tool for directing my eye through the whole space and for confusion, con confusing that pictorial space. Um, and I think I've just always been drawn to those also. When I was in elementary school, I went to a Waldorf school and we would like make our own books. We would kind of we would hear a, a you know kind of like a lecture and then write a little essay and then we could decorate the page and I would like write my essay for like 20 minutes and then spend like five hours decorating the edges of it with these little intricate patterns. Um, so I think that's been like I've just kind of loved those forever and have been finding a way to kind of bring them into the painting I think um, has been has been part of it. I have a question. Yeah. Um, earlier it, with the like still life paintings and the, um, the washer and dryer set, you were talking a lot about um, kind of those fractured colors as a way to kind of break up the space. And I was wondering if you ever like manipulate proportions and sizes and scale of things to kind of change the composition or with the like the kitchen with the lemon and the things that were behind it. Do you ever do that with those? Because um, I know you were talking about like people came and moved things around and that was kind of the compositional tool, but I was wondering if you ever did things further than that to manipulate it. Yeah, the, um, I think I want them to feel somewhat 
spatially convincing, I, or I guess the size of things. So uh, um, like this, this painting that we're looking at here, the figures don't diminish in size as quickly as they should. <laughs> like they do get smaller as they go back, but I've made everybody like larger than they actually would. If you were to take a picture of all these people, you know, at, at, at this much space away from each other, they would be much, much smaller inside this gazebo. Um, so I am kind of cheating it. And I, you see that in like Renaissance paintings too, where like figures don't get smaller in space the way that you think, you know, as much as they should. Um, so I'm like cheating it there, um, but I'm not making like a giant person in the background and a tiny person in the foreground. So I guess there's like a certain amount of rules of size that I'm okay to play with and, and a level at which it feels um, too distracting or something. Just jump on in, KD. What you got? Yeah, okay. Um, so first off, I really appreciate the way that you like reference like historical paintings. And I just think that's, it's so interesting to have a painting where you, there's like the surface level, there's a painting. And then there's so many more layers to it that you can keep rediscovering as you go back into the painting. But, um, and sort of like along those lines, like there's so many people who are gonna see this painting and even artists who are gonna miss those references. And I feel like they're very crucial to the painting and it's, it's, um, its composition and its structure. So I guess I'm kind of wondering like what, if you have like an intended audience and if you really, how important people seeing these references are to your paintings. Yeah, that's a great question. I did an early one of, of these, I did from um, the Velasquez uh, Bacchus painting and I actually used some of the figures directly from the painting and it actually felt too, too related to the painting. Like it felt like you're kind of getting the reference instantly if you, you know, have some familiarity with art history. Um, and I want it actually to be more subtle, I think now. I'm thinking about it really like that armature underneath the sculpture that you don't really see, um, but that is the kind of groundwork, the support that, that makes it strong. And I think I'm actually like, I'm really fine if people don't, I, I almost would prefer it if people didn't see the reference, if people didn't, didn't know um, what it was. I think that there's like, an echo that happens if you do if you do know the, the historical reference, um, like there's this kind of sh like a it gives it like this little bit of power I think to have that relationship like that echo that um, that kind of quoting remembering, um, I think kind of like gives it something. Um, but I'm hoping that that like those paintings are strong because of how they're built and it doesn't matter like if I can take some of that strength of how the composition was made. Um, and kind of use it to make my own composition, like hopefully the, the thing will have some, some solidity to it, um, regardless of if you are familiar with the Delacroix or not. Um, I guess that's, the, I, I kind of want it to be more subtle uh, right now is how I'm thinking about it. Um, yeah. It, that's so interesting to me. I mean, I feel like even if you didn't get the reference at all, it's sort of implicitly there that just because we've, we've seen these type of compositions before. I mean, they've sort of become embedded in our culture, the multiple figure compositions like through cinema mm -hmm. or theater or something like that. And it's something about that kind of gravitas. And then the subject matter is this, what well, you're painting is kind of mundane middle class American life. It's sort of insistent that that middle class American life is, is serious, like it's important. <laughs> Right, it's there is something that's even. nice, yeah, right, about kind of, ele like that, that, yeah, that, that, I like that a lot, yeah, um, and, and that these, and especially like this kind of women's world of like, the, yeah, this kind of middle class suburbia, um, you know, that's sort of centered on, again, these kind of older women in this scene who we tend to kind of overlook, um, who are given the status of, of a grand history painting in this context, that they're, they're made at a monumental scale, that they are, you know, just as important as a, you know, religious scene or a, or a historical, you know, tragedy or something, but there's something that's like, um, gives it some, some importance. Um, yeah. And I think they're just, they're, I think, yeah, again, if you, even if you don't know that specific painting that I'm relating to, I think people see these like in the relationship to, you know, in relationship to that kind of history of multiple figure composition that we've, th these kind of resonate as, um, in relationship to paintings that we've seen. Yeah. Nice. Uh, we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions if 
Anybody? Sure. Uh, oh, Jane, do you have your hand? Your hand's up there. Yeah, you were all just uh, speaking about this painting and uh, about uh, uh, the sort of, um, you know, white middle class culture and giving it a kind of gravitas. One of the things you've been chatting about, you know, I always think a little bit about world of, not world events, but, you know, um, who we are as painters and how we're reacting to what's, you know, around us that at times we're um, uh, sort of maybe escaping it and other times we're sort of trying to grapple with it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting to me that in, in all the richness of the complexity here, you're also dealing with tons of people who are maskless <laughs> and touching and, and all very with each other. It's like you're a, a big extended family gathering that we can't really have uh, yeah. these days. And I'm just wondering if you're a little bit aware of that or if that's kind of secondary, you know, just curious. Yeah, I started this, these paintings take forever. So I started this one two years ago um, yeah. before this was even a glimmer. Um, and I actually stopped working on it for about four months at the beginning of the pandemic because it just felt too weird and too separate from my experience in that moment. Um, and I'm making some paintings now. Um, I'm making a kind of larger interior space where the figures are all kind of disconnected from each other. They're all kind of in their own world a little bit so I've got and it's just um you know my family looks like four of us who are you know kind of in set like one person in the kitchen one person in the living room one person in the dining room and they're all kind of <laughs> so I'm, I am making some paintings that I think are coming out of this year a, a little bit more um He's curious. yeah but then I think after a few months it felt good to come back to this one and and just um I think maybe yeah be in that um be in that world and I guess I, I have been thinking about like there does there is something that's weird about making these you know paintings about kind of suburban life um, when there's so much else going on in the world and I think I'm in some ways um, I don't know like I, in some ways I'm not quite sure how to approach all of that like I don't want to make paintings with masks or something right now I, I want it to like I want it to like affect the work in a more subtle kind of interior way I think um, the experience that I'm having. Um, and also painting a little bit more out of my direct experience. Like I've been seeing images from this pandemic of um, you know, people in these hazmat suits and all of this stuff. But my experience has actually been just this really quiet uh, at home, like subdued world. And so I'm making a painting that's kind of of that, um, yeah. which is kind of my experience of what I'm having here. Um, so I guess that's how I've been, how I've been approaching it. Beautiful talk, by the way, and beautiful work. Oh, thank you so much. Nice. Hi, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so first, thank you just for sharing everything about your work. Um, but going back to your love for patterns within your compositions, um, all of the rectangles within your compositions that are kind of like translucently like overlaid and found mm. within them. I'm wondering if that's something you arrive at like throughout your process, like how how planned it is um, or if it's more like improvisational, you know, and it kind of organically happens. Yeah, the, that part is really um, organically finding it as I go through. A lot of it is responding to problems that I'm having in the composition that I'm like trying to work out. Um, and so rather than, so in, in some cases, like in this painting, I ended up moving people. There was like a different figure who was sitting here um, and this person was sitting over here. Uh, you know, so I'm like moving things around you know, like actual objects sometimes, or I'm, I added this fish really late on to kind of lead our eye into the space, a uh, little fish butt. Um, mm -hmm. But other times I'm thinking like, can I just break up this big, um, you know, plane of the um, gazebo with a, you know, can I just use like a, 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 a rectangle to break up that space and lead my eye up? Like, I think I was feeling too separated the, the I wasn't able to access that top section of the painting from the figures everything was completely held in that bottom kind of figure region um, so this is like a little bridge up to the roof and this is like a little bridge kind of up to the sky that I was trying to like carry us up into the into the rest of the painting um, so I've just been at, at times adding these kind of shapes and colors in to try and 
again, you know, get it working as a, as a composition. So I, I think like this black shape came in late and this way that I broke up the leg, like that leg was just not working. It was like kicking my eye off the edge and, um, and, and it was like a weird, weird shape, like that just wasn't working as a shape. So I think then getting the, this kind of diagonal relationship between these two abstract shapes, like worked better visually for me. And it kind of repeated the angles that I'm seeing between this bathing suit top and this woman's bathing suit and kind of carried me up through this um, lower right to upper left-hand diagonal better. So I'm kind of, that's the way that those they end up just sort of, I try it and it's like, I try and I try and I try a whole bunch of different iterations of how to get it to work. Um, and that's just one of the tools that I'm using. Cool, thank yeah. you. Yeah, cause it really does take on more of like a quilt like collage like aspect. So, um, and you've harmonized all of those elements really well, so. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, we can nice. um, end Thanks the for formal that. proceedings. I'll stop recording, but we should probably in our digital way, uh, thank Zoe, however you want to do that. Thank, thank you, you, Zoe. Zoe. Thanks, Zoe. Nice, and thanks, Sharon. I saw this um, name of another uh, Weaver, so that's great. That's, uh, I'll check that out.